Um, so like so many people here, uh, um, my lab tries to integrate concepts and approaches from developmental biology, evolutionary biology, um, and, evol um, and ecology to understand what I think is one of the most fascinating properties of, of biological systems. And I know I'm not alone in this. This is, uh, I'm huge, was hugely influenced by a per paper from David Stern very early on, sort of praising variation and its importance. And it stuck with me. I really think it's one of the most beautiful properties of biology is that there's always variation. Whenever you look, even for clonal species, for clonal populations, you'll find variation in all sorts of phenotypes. You'll find variation in phenotypes. It's also heritable variation is what drives, it's sort of the, the, the raw material for evolutionary change. And it's shaped by mutation that introduces new variants, development that reads genotypes and makes phenotypes, and evolution that filters phenotypes uh, uh, generation after generation. All of these processes are greatly affected by the environment, the outside environmental conditions. And today I'm going to focus on the effects of the environment on phenotype expression, on this property that Benjamin explained so beautifully, developmental plasticity in particular, that phenotype expression depends on the conditions, the environmental conditions that individuals experience during development. Okay? Um, very often, um, Plasticity is represented graphically by these reaction norms that shows you phenotype as a function of environmental condition. Um, there's many well-known examples, including cast uh, 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 formation in social insects, um, pa color patterns in many butterflies, in this case depending on day length, uh, density that determines whether these uh, swarming locusts develop into the gregarious or the solitary form or the very well-known example of Daphnia, that it, when in the presence, when it molds in the presence of predators, it evolves these structures that are meant to defend it against predation. So that this can happen, like one genotype gives multiple phenotypes, a series of things need to happen, okay? Organisms need to be able to perceive what's happening outside of them, what the conditions are externally. So there's these sensors that Benjamin already talked about. Somehow the information needs to reach the tissues that in insects are developing internally. So there needs to be some sort of uh, means to inform tissues developing internally of what's happening outside. So there's a series of modulators. And then in these tissues that have plastic phenotypes, there will be effector genes, the ones that are going to be differentially expressed at different temperatures or have different activities at different temperatures. And in the end, from one genotype, you produce alternative phenotypes. In the case of adaptive developmental plasticity, we need to have it that whatever is induced by the environmental conditions somehow makes organisms better fitted, better adjusted to the conditions they will experience. And in many cases, the same environmental cue that induces changes in development is the one that is the, 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 the selective environment that organisms will be sensing, like in many cases of temperature, plasticity, that organisms are, for example, deriving different phenotypes for thermoregulation, or in the case of Daphnia, it's the presence of the predator that develops it. But it doesn't need to be the exact same cue. It just ne there needs to be uh, predict predictability that connects one cue to the other. And I'm going to exemplify that with one example. So many people have worked on developmental plasticity, and we typically choose our favorite species or couples of species and have it in the lab developing in fixed environmental conditions, okay? Or uh, conditions that are not made to change during the time it takes to complete development. We know that's very rarely the case in natural populations where uh, environmental conditions are extremely dynamical, plus there's not ever one single cue that is changing, okay? You'll have temperature, but at the same time you might have photoperiod humidity. So what happens when you have multiple cues? Do they interact? Are they redundant with each other? Do they uh, synergize? Are they just additive? Um, Natural populations also have gazillions of genotypes, and we know that not all genotypes are going to do the same in relation to environmental conditions. And Benjamin just showed a case where we're trying to, where he tried to map and achieved to map the genetic basis of, of variation in plasticity. And then there's always species interactions that further complicate that. I'm obviously not going to uh, try to to go at all of these, but I'm going to give you some examples where we're trying to consider some sort of a um, bit more complex scenarios, and in particular using these two um, organisms in the lab, so the bicyclists and inana butterflies that Antonio already introduced, and the rosophila flute flies that many have introduced, but mostly I look at pigmentation that Trisha talked about too. 
Okay, so in the butterfly case, these butterflies occur very much like Drosophila melanogaster originally from sub or Drosophila in general, Sub-Saharan Africa, where they live in highly seasonal environments that alternate uh, wet season and dry season. And these are pictures of the same spots uh, in, in, a, in a savanna, a place where they collect these butterflies in different seasons of the year. And you see it's quite different in terms of vegetation cover. And vegetation cover is going to matter a lot. Um, if you go to these spots in the alternative seasons and you catch the butterflies, uh, you bring them into the lab and they'll look quite differently. So typically the, uh, the dry season form has just overall uh, brown pigmentation patterns. They don't have these conspicuous pattern elements called the eye spots. And you'll find typically a single generation during the dry season, whilst in the wet season you'll find these butterflies that have these beautiful uh, pattern elements along the margin of the wing that Antonio already talked about. So the dry, wet and dry season differ obviously in quantity of, of rain in humidity that is exemplified with the histogram here, but there's also temperature that varies. And the temperature kind of predicts, oops, sorry, I'm walking the reverse way around. So there's a decrease in temperature that precedes the coming of the dry season and an increase in temperature that precedes the coming of the dry season. And in fact, we know now that these butterflies respond to temperature during development to make the alternative seasonal phenotypes. And very much like in the story of the wall lizard, there's not just one single trait varying. There's a suit of traits, so much so that we talk about a plasticity syndrome. So the individuals from the dry season, okay, they have um, cryptic wing, pattern, uh, wing patterns, but they also have particular uh, direction of change in a series of, long, of life history traits, whilst the dry, the wet season have this conspicuous um, wing pattern elements, and then they also have sort of a um, live fast, die young, a fast pace uh, life history. And this presumably, though, so remember in the lab we can make them develop into one or the other season, just changing temperature during development, and um, these different um, traits, these different phenotypes, work together um, to um, ensure different strategies, different seasonal strategies for survival and for uh, reproduction. So in the wet, uh, uh, Antonio already showed beautifully how these eye spots attract the attention of, uh, in particular, predatory um, insects towards the margin of the wings and away from the fragile body. So they work, they have the strategy for deflecting the attention of predators, attracting them to the margin of the wings, whilst in the, the dry season where they're very uh, unconspicuous, they rely on crypsis. So it's like a brown butterfly sitting on a background of brown leaves, so they're just avoiding being seen by the predators in general. In terms of reproduction, again, so in the, in the wet season we have lots of plants available to feed the next generation of young larvae, and the individuals that come up as adults in the wet season just immediately reproduce and they go on with their life, they die fast, a new generation comes in. Whilst in the dry season, it seems like pretty pointless to go and lay eggs when there's no food plants at all available to feed your young, okay? So they have a different strategy. They invest in a, a survival until the end of the season, and only then do females lay their eggs. Uh, that are now going to have plants to feed them. Okay, so these different strategies ensured by a series of traits that respond to developmental temperature. We know this is mediated um, by a change in the dynamics of the hormonic dizone. I'm not going to get much into this today. Um, in many cases, and kind of like the, the, the traits Benjamin was telling about, we have uh, in insects, allometabolous insects, a series of decisions that are made uh, during development. You're then stuck with the phenotype during adult life. You no longer change your body size. You no longer change uh, your coloration pattern. But there are other traits that need to be or are responsive to the adult environment, and still do we find developmental plasticity in those? How much do we have a signature of uh, the history during ontogeny on traits that should be responsive during adult life? And today I'll tell you a little bit about behavior and, and immunity that we're interested in looking in these butterflies. So with Eric van Bergen, who was a, a postdoc in the lab, he was um, very much interested in behavioral type of ecology, so um, we combine our interests in trying to look at the possibility that, okay, so we know that these individuals from the dry season, they really need to survive until the end of the season if there's any chance the eggs of those females will have plants to eat and come up with the next generation, okay? Uh, so we hypothesized that there should be a in the same way that there's developmental plasticity in appearance, and we know 
that appearance works really well in conjunction with behavior for, for example, deceiving predators, we wondered if there was also developmental plasticity in behavior. And in particular, we had predicted two types of behavior that should be matching uh, the appearance of the adults and that are very common in a context of crypsis. One is this thing called, I don't see my mouse, oh, it's here. This thing called a background matching, okay? So individuals look like their background, they choose to go on a background that kind of matches their color. And the other one, it's illustrated here. Crypsis works really well when you don't move, okay? Once you move, we can see you. So we had predicted that we would see developmental plasticity in these two aspects. One, background matching, which would mean brown butterflies will choose a brown background to rest upon, okay? Uh, and in uh, low activity levels, brown butterflies will move less than, than non-brown butterflies, conspicuous butterflies. So how we tested this is we grew butterflies uh, or caterpillars at the low temperature that induces the formation of the dry season versus the high temperature that induces the formation of the black seasons. And then we had the adults, the adult temperature also tested at the two temperatures. And we put them in these cages uh, that Eric sort of built with his own hands that had backgrounds of squares of green and black, okay? And essentially, he would throw a bunch of butterflies inside of these cages. They're large enough that they're flying and they're doing their normal thing. Take photos every four minutes and just see um, how often do they move and when they move, do they tend to go to brown versus to, to green, okay? So in a way, we could test those two uh, 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 hypotheses and I'm not gonna go much into the methods they're here for the aficionados, but I can tell you that we did confirm the hypothesis that butterflies reared on the cooler temperatures, 19 here, so the blue dots, um, typically are more likely to move into a brown square than the butterflies that uh, were grown at the higher temperatures that make then the larger eye spots, okay? On the other hand, we did not see any difference in the likelihood to move around. So we confirmed one of the, the plas developmental plasticity in one of the behaviors that is expected to increase the efficiency of cryptosis as a strategy for avoiding predation, but not the other one. Um, how come? We don't know. So we don't know what developmental plasticity, what temperature is during the development. Is it affecting perception of the colors? Is it affecting the eyes? We don't know. Is it affecting a real preference? So is it somehow affecting the brains of those butterflies and instilling a signature of what your his past history was because it is predictive of what your adult environment will be? Another really cool trait um, that typically is very adjustable, should be responsive to adult life, is a, a defense against pathogens, okay? And I've explained to you on how, even though it's responsive in adult life, we could come up with a reasoning, how come we would expect there to be developmental plasticity in immunity, in your ability to fight pathogens in these butterflies. And this goes back to the different strategies for reproduction in these butterflies. These guys here from the dry season, they really need to survive until the end of the season, okay? They don't just immediately reproduce. So it made sense to us that they would be better able to fight pathogen infection. Not only they're living longer, so they're more likely to get infected, but then they really need that because they can't lay eggs before um, plants become available. So uh, Yara Rodrigues uh, took this project on, and here we had, the prediction was that the dry season butterflies, so these brown ones, would be better at defense. So these are the ones that need to ensure survival until the end of seasons, and if, if they're gonna have any progeny alive. And how she tested this, this is, was done together with David Duneau, you know, a, a collaborator, we had caterpillars developing at either the low temperature or the high temperature, and then would inject the adults with a, a Pseudomonas entomophila, it's, it's a bacteria that is very common in insects, and just score survival, okay? The prediction is that if indeed the dry season butterflies, so the ones grown at temp the low temperatures, are better at fighting pathogen infection, you would see it in the survival curves. It would take them longer to die off, okay? Um, so sure enough, this is what we see, but only for females, okay? So what we see here, again, blue is for the low developmental temperature, red is for the higher developmental temperature, squares are males, and uh, circles are females. We see that the females from the dry versus the wet season-like phenotypes do differ in their survival uh, after injection. 
but the, the, there's no difference in the males, okay? This could be presumably explained because it is the f if, if the females lay, um, mate early in the season and store the spermatophore and only mate later, it just doesn't really matter if males are around at the end of the season as long as they've already ensured that they have the sperm to, to fertilize their eggs. Um, and in particular, because David is a host, planted, a host pathogen interaction person, he were interested also in looking what, what is happening to the bacteria inside of these hosts, okay? So this was a, like a huge effort from Miara, who would be picking butterflies uh, some particular time after infection, live butterflies, and would measure the bacterial load inside butterflies. So we wanted to see if the developmental history of the host impacted the growth of the butterflies in a common adult environment, okay? So the we know that temperature is not directly affecting uh, the bacteria because there's a single uh, uh, adult's temperature. And what we see here, so the, dot, the kind of yellow or whatever these are, dots are like the real data and then you fit sort of the typical curve that just usually describes bacterial growth with a lag phase, then a log phase and a stationary phase. Uh, from the data from the individuals developed at the low temperature versus the high temperature. And indeed, it was mostly for the duration of the lag phase that we see significant differences. So whatever was happening during the development of those butterflies was making it that the bacteria took much longer to sort of kick off in these hosts. And this was uh, sufficient to ensure that there were differences in mortality re responding to the parasite. So we're still kind of looking into this data in particular, trying to figure out how this happens, which is what is here. So it's not clear to us, and uh, we hope to have it soon cleared out, if developmental temperature is already sort of bumping up the um, basal levels of immune response, or if it's just making the immune system much more responsive so that it can much more quickly uh, go off when um, individuals are infected. And finally, or not finally, I'm gonna talk about that there's in real populations, multiple genotypes and not all genotypes do the same thing. So this is maybe it's sort of an exaggerated, uh, blah, 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 exaggerated representation of that again with, with these reaction norms and the different colors here represents uh, different made up uh, phenotypes, um, sorry, genotypes. So you have the genotype red and the genotype blue. And this would be a case where different genotypes have opposite reactions to, to the environment. It doesn't need to be this extreme, right? You can just have different slopes of these reaction norms is an indication that different genotypes are responding to environmental conditions in different manners. So there's a difference in plasticity. And again, Benjamin illustrated this really well. So we started with the butterflies because it's our system of interest. And what we see here is a bunch of families, different families from the same outbred stock of, of butterflies that we have. And we just have this, the, the eggs of these families were split into temperatures. Out came the adults after a long wait, and then we measured their phenotype. In particular, this one eye spot that Antonia also referred to, it was her, the one that is present in all species, and it's also the one we typically use to measure plasticity. I'm just showing you one eye spot, but, um, so what we see here is the phenotype from the butterflies that were grown at lower temperatures in blue, and we just ordered the families by their phenotype under the blue temperatures. The large circles are the means, and the little circles are the actual individual dots, okay? These are only females, we also did it for males. And then you have above is the phenotype from the same families, but now when they were grown at higher temperature. So what is already pretty obvious is that the blue dots are always underneath the red dots. So they always have larger eye spots when they're grown at a larger temperature. But the distance between the blue dot and the red dot is not the same across families, okay? And presumably this suggests that there's a genetic variation for how much plasticity we have, okay? And we could be brave like Benjamin and go and try to figure out in these butterflies. But then I remembered, hold on. The fly people have this amazing resource that is called the DTRPs, it, what they were mentioned before, the Drosophila Genetic Reference Panel. It's about 200 isogenic lines of these flies that have been fully sequenced and are available for the whole community to order in and do whatever you want with them, okay? So in a way, we thought this was an easier way to get into what is the genetic basis of intergenotype differences in plasticity, okay? 
Trisha already introduced you to the back view of a headless fly, and this is it again here, just to tell you that we've typically measured both the thorax and the abdomen, there's transects that you could maybe see along these two body parts, and we're interested both in body size and body pigmentation, two traits that are known to be very thermally plastic. So the temperature at which organisms develop will matter for their size, it will matter for their pigmentation, okay? So we have many genotypes, we grow them at two temperatures, and then we measure two, two, uh, two body parts. And we want to know what is the genetic basis. So what explains differences in plastic? Oh, first of all, are there differences in plasticity, which you kind of pretty much knew there were, because there are always, there's always variation when you look for it. What are, what are the genes that are responsible for that? Are they the same genes that explain inter-genotype inter variation within one temperature. Because if you grow these DGRPs at different temperatures, it's several genotypes, you'll also see differences in body size. You'll also see differences in body pigmentation, okay? And to what extent um, are the same genes that are responsible for plasticity in one trait responsible for plasticity in another trait? Which would have been my prediction when I started the project. Hint, hint. Okay. So again, this is a figure very similar to the one that I've showed you for the, for the butterflies. But now for about 191 here and 196 here, different isogenic lines of Drosophila melanogaster. Again, we've ordered the lines, the genotypes, by what their phenotype is for the lowest temperature. And just as an illustration of all sorts of traits that we have done, here we have body size, in fact it's uh, thorax size, and here we have abdomen darkness, which is just a measurement along the uh, how dark they are overall the abdomen, sort of not taking into consideration particular segments or just the bands on those segments. And again, what you see here is um, for, oh, oh, of course, here are estimates of the um, broad, broad sense heritability, just based on how much intra versus inter line variation we see here. So they're, they're okay, I and mean, they're sufficient for us to be confident that there's genetic variation and that we can maybe attempt to map it. What we again see here is that the Blue uh, dots are typically above the red dots, meaning butterflies that are grown at, sorry, I'm doing the opposite mistake. <laughs> Flies that are grown at the low temperature are usually uh, smaller, sorry, larger, and they are, so they're, they're higher on, on the thorax size, and they're usually darker, okay? They're higher on the overall darkness measurements. The red dots tend to be underneath, but that's not always the case, okay? So unlike the butterflies where there was different distances between the red, uh, the only difference we saw was how distant the red and the blue dots were, here sometimes we see them uh, going the opposite direction. And if you look at sort of these same data here could be turned into this reaction norm, so we just have one line for each one of the genotypes. And we have here the, the reaction norms that had um, a slope that was not statistically significantly different from zero, it's, that's what the N zero means, or that was in the positive direction versus the negative direction, okay? So most genotypes are doing what insects are kind of expected to do, is to grow larger bodies at, at cooler temperatures and to be darker at cooler temperatures, but uh, not all genotypes are doing this, okay? So we can now, I'm just gonna focus on thorax size um, because this, um, data set has been published. Um, and what we can do now is think of the slope of these reaction norms as a quantitative trait. And then ask questions using GWAS approach, what, is, what are the loci that matter for variation in these quantitative traits? Okay, so this is just illustrating uh, uh, the frequency distribution of um, the slope of the reaction norms. And this is a very shabby uh, Manhattan plot. So we've seen these beautiful Manhattan plots from everybody with these beautiful single peaks. What is up with that? Okay, nothing. Okay, they're all over the place. And we have validated, uh, 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 with not all of the, QTL, uh, the QTLs that we found because with many traits, but we validated some and they, they do confirm. But it's really not a simple uh, genetic basis. And now remember, I'm I, I, saying the first day that Jean-Louis David would have liked to know the genetic basis and if it's the same genes, well, not in our hands, but clearly in Benjamin's. So. Okay, so some sort of, um, um, 
main findings, uh, in, because we cannot now concentrate on a single gene and tell you a beautiful story about a massive effect QTL, because that's not what we see. But there are interesting patterns in the data. Okay, One really interesting pattern is that most QTLs that we find, and remember we did body uh, size and, and uh, body pigmentation in the thorax versus in the abdomen, most, most of the QTLs we find are private. They matter only for one trait. And they're even private if you consider, so what we see here, variation within temperature versus variation in plasticity. So the intersection of these Venn diagrams is a lot of nothing, right? So there's very little shared. So it's unlike panier that seems to matter for color pattern development and then for color pattern plasticity. Private QTLs. Another interesting finding is that most of the significant QTLs show that the allele that confers higher plasticity is at a low frequency in the DGRPs, which is maybe unexpected if you think that plasticity is adaptive and it's kind of useful to keep it at some sort of high frequency. Again, not what we find, okay? So what we show here, I mean, maybe I should introduce you the plot, is significant QTLs for the, si for the plasticity in thorax size, okay? where in, in gray we show the major allele, in purple the minor allele, and then the size of the circle um, also represents the frequency of, of the, of this, the uh, how many lines had this particular allele. So I think what, what I want you to see here is that the gray dots are below the purple dots. So the alleles that confer higher plasticity, high plasticity is measured here, the slope of the reaction norm are above, so they're at low frequencies. And finally, if we try to, and we want it again in this beautiful um, sequence of steps that needs to happen, so do we find QTLs that are in one particular type of process that needs to happen? Again, all over the place, okay? So we did CAG analysis, and this is kind of a more of a bi-i, but we could make sto up stories that these are presumably sensing, modulating, and effector types of genes. Okay, so I already told you in a nutshell, a lot of genetic variation, private QTLs, diverse gene functions, and low frequency, and um, to what extent are the QTLs that we are identifying in, in, in the lab, which of course, these are all naturally segregating alleles, the DGRPs represent natural segregating variation to a large extent, but they don't represent naturally occurring genotypes, right? They were highly inbred through many generations to ensure that they're isogenic. Um, so this would be one of the confounding defects that maybe what we're seeing in the lab are not the alleles that matter for plasticity in natural populations and get selected in natural populations. And the other thing is that, okay, we see flies are darker if you develop them at lower temperatures, but Dimitri, the first day, he told us on how this also varies seasonal and there's genetic variation, uh, uh, there's changes in, in allele frequencies happening at a scale of across, gener across seasons in a, in, within a year that could maybe justify some of the, ch the the, the variation in plasticity we see in nature. So yes, this is the, the, the people that contributed mainly, mostly for this that I told you about, and I'm very sorry I don't have to tell you about our work on species interactions on non-dynamic cues, but yeah, um, or on other species that we work with. Thank you so much for your attention. Again, Virginie and Abdou, um, and I'm here for questions. Thank you.